Hey guys, it's Dan from Soil Eater and welcome back to our One Take Wednesday series. Today on episode 27, I'm gonna break down how I position my holster and how I recommend you guys position your holster, but also understanding and explaining to you guys the reasons why I do it. All right, so first things I'm gonna go over is the different levels of holsters. You guys have probably heard uh, of different levels of holsters. Usually it's level one, level two, level three. So I'm gonna discuss what those mean and then I'm gonna kind of give you my thought process as to why I set up my holster and the way my holster is oriented on my body uh, based on kind of my, my philosophy on it, all right? And again, this isn't stuff I made up. This is stuff that was passed down to me by, by other people, competitive shooters, uh, tactical shooters, right? That sort of thing. So first things I'm gonna go over is what is a level one holster? So a level one holster is going to be a holster like this. So any, I shouldn't say any, but most appendix holsters or most like pancake holsters or holsters that you uh, carry on the side here, basically any of your Kydex holsters, right? This is gonna be a level one holster. And what that means is the only retention on this holster, the only, re only thing retaining your firearm is going to be the holster itself and the molded holster that, that kind of presses into your, your handgun that allows it to be securely in there. There's no added retention and no other steps that are needed or necessary to draw your handgun, all right? Next will be a level two. This is a Savari Land 6360. I'm sorry, 6354 uh, red dot sight. This one's a 6360. But this uh, holster is made for a red dot. It's for my duty gun, the Glock 17 uh, Gen 5 MOS. Uh, this holster right here is a level two holster, right? So you put your, your gun in it. It's got the, you know, the mold around it, so that holds the firearm. But it also has an additional level of security. That security right here is what Safari Land has or what Safari Land calls the ALS or the auto locking system. Essentially, when you insert your firearm into this holster, if you go to pull it up, it is retained by a plastic insert here. And the only way, I shouldn't say the only way, but extreme force will eventually get it out of there, right? Like if you're the Hulk. Uh, but other than that, the only way to get it out is to slide this little lever back. And by sliding that back, you can then draw the gun, all right? Uh, Safari Lands are my favorite holsters for retention. Uh, that being said, that it's also the only ones I have experience with. It's the only ones that are, I'm allowed to carry for work, so it's the only ones I have experience with. Uh, I do have a, I did have a Blade Tech one back in the day. Uh, Blade Tech's really stepped up their game, man. I, I have nothing bad to say about Blade Tech. Their, their stuff's pretty awesome, the new stuff they're coming out with. But um, I'm stuck with Safari Land, so that's what I'm familiar with, uh, and that's what I'm going to be explaining today. So a level two holster means that it holds the gun and then also has one additional step of retention. That for this one is this little slider known as the ALS. So you have to draw that back to draw the gun. The next one is going to be level three. And I'm gonna pull this out of the QLS just to show you guys. So a level three holster is going to have multiple, excuse me, multiple retention, right? So it has the kydex that goes around the gun and then it also has two forms of retention. So two additional steps, making it a level three, all right? So it holds the gun, that's one. It has the ALS or the auto lock system right here that you have to slide back. And then it has the hood or bail you'll hear that referred to. All right. Uh, and then it has this little piece right here. All this does is help uh, protect your red dot from the elements, snow, sleet, rain, that sort of thing. Mud, any of that. Pock, you know, lint, stuff like that. So basically in order to draw this handgun, you have to push down on the bail or the hood. And then as you, you grab your, your, um, your firearm and get a good proper grip, you defeat that ALS by sliding it back and then you draw your handgun. All right, I'm not gonna get into the draw, that, that's something for the range, a video for the range, but I just wanted to let you guys know kind of the holsters I'm talking about. So now you're on the market to pick a holster. What holster do you want? Well, let me break down my thought process on it because I believe it's important when picking out a holster uh, and then I will give you the information and then you can figure out based on what your needs are, what holster you want. So when do I carry a level one holster, so, right? So for me, a level one holster does not give me any time to have any sort of weapon retention in the event that someone was to sneak up to me and grab my gun from behind or from the side or anything like that. So the really the only time I wear a level one holster is going to be appendix, in which case it's concealed. So now I don't have to worry about someone coming up and grabbing my gun from me because I, one, I have a shirt over it, so you'd have to grab the gun and the shirt. And two, you have to know I have a gun on me, right? Uh, this is a tier one concealed uh, appendix holster. And uh, I, I like this holster quite a bit. I use it daily for my plain clothes assignment. And this holster uh, fits really nice in there and doesn't print very much, right? I'm carrying a full-size Glock 17. Uh, it prints, it 
you really have to be looking for a gun and know what you're looking for in order to see it. So that's when I would wear a level one, is a time where it's either concealed or the other one would be if I'm going to like uh, a training where there's all other cops uh, and uh, you know I, there's no perceived threats because I'm leaving my car, going to in-service, getting back in my car and going home for the day. And that one would be right on the side here, but I've actually moved away for that quite a bit and have focused on this. You'll see a lot of guys carrying those type of Kydex holsters on like the two, three o'clock when they go to court and stuff. I would say court's not really a super safe place, right? Obviously you're going to court for someone you arrested or someone, so you know, some sort of investigation you were at. So I would probably run at the very least a level two holster for that. It just buys you time, all right? So I'll get into that. What What is the level of security buying you? It's buying you time to react, time to process information and time to start working on weapon retention. Uh, why do I think that's important? All right, well, my background, I've got a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I've been training for a bunch of years. Took, some, took a couple years off just based on kids and injuries and surgeries and that sort of thing. I'm getting back into it again now. Um, shout out to those guys. But it buys me time. Even with a grappling background, it allows me to react, right? If someone was to come up behind me, right, we always see the memes and those freaking memes crack me up about like the weapon retention and, you know, grab the officer's gun and that sort of thing. Uh, Requiem of a Dream, you know, all those, all those things, a good movie. But basically, you, you get the holster, you have it on you, and I want to have some sort of retention to allow me to retain that firearm. Now, when would I pick a level two versus a level three? All right, so I'm seeing a lot of guys run the level twos, and here's my philosophy on it. If I am going out on patrol, so I am responding to calls for service, a typical uniform police officer, I want a level three. All right, a level three is going to provide me the most retention and the most time and security to have that firearm. So the bad guy has to either break this holster, so a mechanical issue, or has to know how to operate this holster in order to draw my firearm. All right, the reason why I like having the level three is the chances of me being alone in a fight, in which case a suspect's grabbing my gun or reaching for my gun, the time that I'm in that fight is gonna be way longer because I'm not with someone potentially, right? There's definitely times on patrol where you guys know where I'm, you're fighting with someone, you're fighting with someone for a few minutes, right? Uh, depending on the area that you operate in, the environment you operate in, there, there could be times where you're fighting for someone for 15 minutes before anyone's there to help you. So that the more retention I have, the better in my opinion. Now you have to remember, the more retention you have is also going to cause a delay or you know more time to draw your firearm. Now, if you practice with this uh, level three holsters, I'm very and I'm not I'm I'm not even the fastest guy out there for sure. I'll say that uh, I can accurately draw this firearm and fire around in a center mass like a zone target at 21 feet in 0.9 seconds. Right? It's not groundbreaking. A lot of people can do that. But what I'm saying is that you're not you're still pretty fast, right? I've gotten down, if I sit there and practice it, I can get down to 0.8, you know, point, I think 0.8 was probably my fastest. Um, but that means I defeat the hood, defeat the ALS and draw the firearm, bring it up, get a, good, get a good enough sight picture to hit an A zone at 21 feet. That was kind of my standard with holsters. So you can still be fast with a level three. And in my opinion, the level three in that added retention is better than a level two where I'm just a little bit faster, right? Because most of the time, if I need to draw my gun you, or you need to draw your gun, you know ahead of time, most of the time, right? Or you're doing something that you have a heightened awareness where you're like, hey, I could possibly have to draw my gun, right? If I'm on a traffic stop, I've mentioned this in some of my other videos. If I'm on a traffic stop, I keep that, that hand right on the hood, right here, right? So it just sits there. You know, I'm, I'm just like this, have a conversation, have my flashlight on my arm, whatever I need to, depending on the day I'm working, you know, the time of day I'm working. And then if I ever need to draw my gun, my hand's already indexing that hood, I can quickly draw my gun. Sometimes what I see people doing is they'll go on traffic stops and they'll put their hood down. I don't recommend that because one, you're changing the draw, right? You're used to drawing like this with the hood up. So by going like this, you're now changing your draw and you've just defeated one of the uh, retention features on there, right? So now, if the guy is gets out of his car and he's not a shoot and you can't use lethal force, right? You're not justified to use lethal force and that someone just get out of the car, you're not just going to pull out your gun and shoot them, right? So they have, they're unarmed, they open up their car door and it's going to be a fight now. Are you going to remember to now click that hood up or did you just make it easier for that guy to draw your firearm? Something to think about, right? I would recommend always utilizing a level three for a patrol 
Uh, so whenever you're on the patrol by yourself, I'd recommend a level three. I don't believe, and I would argue in the comments, sit there and argue with, argue with me in the comments, guys. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right on this, but again, it's just my opinion. So there's no real right or wrong, right? It's just my opinion. But if you have a, if you are completely against it, let me know. I'd, I'd be interested to see what your take is on it. Um, so that's it. You're gonna be a little slower out of the holster, but in my opinion, the added retention and added security of your firearm uh, pays off for that, all right? So when would I utilize a level two? This is actually the first level two holster I've ever bought. All right, uh, and I actually just picked it up during the Black Friday deal with Safari Land. So I either run, usually, the level one or the level three, depending on what I'm doing. I picked up a level two because I wanted to try it out um, because who am I to say, you know, level two is not the way to go if I have never tried it. So here's my concerns with level two or kind of my thought process behind it, all right? This holster is gonna be utilized for uh, SWAT. It's gonna be utilized for a team environment, all right? So you can already see the difference between a level three where I'm out on patrol by myself and a level two where I have a team, I'm in a team environment, all right? Now, what's the difference there? Well, hopefully, or in my thought process, the difference is, is that if I'm gonna get in a fight with someone in a CQB environment where we're clearing a structure on a, high, let's say a high risk search warrant, right? So we got a person who's a no guy, he's, you know, you try to pin him up against the floor, he's not obeying commands, you have to use defensive tactic techniques on them. Uh, at some point, it gets into a fight, right? You're fighting now with this guy. How long are you gonna have to fight with that person until you have like three of your boys helping you fight with them, right? Hopefully not long in that sort of CQB environment, unless there's obviously a bunch of people in the room. So if I was ever going to cut down on the level of retention, I would do so in a team environment where it's not just me there, right? I don't, I don't wear my SWAT belt on patrol where I'm gonna be in a fight one-on-one. -on -one. Like if you, if you fight with me on a, on a high research warrant, you're gonna have me and 10 of my boys with you, right? So that's kind of my thought process behind the different levels. Again, I think it's important that you guys understand it because you're gonna have to make a decision if your department even allows you to. Uh, another thing you'll notice here is this is the guard and this is just to help protect uh, someone getting to the hood from the front. So if they're facing you, it helps protect that hood. You'll notice on this one, I took it off. All right, because again, it's that team environment. Uh, another thing you'll notice on these is the nub mod. So. I highly recommend, I will put the nub mod on every Safari Land holster. And what the nub mod is, is a little metal uh, accessory that basically goes on that ALS system and makes the nub, so there's like a little nub there, a little plastic nub. The nub mod goes over that, bolts down into it, and you use Loctite, and makes it like twice the size. So it's much easier to get, and it makes you much faster. Uh, if your thumb's just a little off, you have more you know, surface area there to grab which will help you in the draw and it, it speeds you up hands down. All right, so now let's talk about accessories for your holster that you can purchase. And again, I'll say this disclaimer, I should have said at the beginning of the video, make sure you're following all your department's policies and procedures when it comes to any sort of holster for work, rather so on patrol, on SWAT, anything like that, make sure you're following your policies and procedures. Do not get jammed up or jam yourself up for utilizing equipment that is not uh, you know, sanctioned by your department, all right? so. Next, I'll get into some accessories that are gonna, that I believe are gonna speed you up. Most Safari Land holsters, I don't even have it here, but most Safari Land holsters, uh, I don't, here, where is it? Let me look for it real quick. Uh, oh, here it is. Most Safari Land holsters are gonna come with some sort of belt attachment, all right? The problem with these, especially RDS holsters, so the red dot sight holsters, is I don't know who they were designed for, but they definitely weren't designed to have your holster at like the two or three o'clock. They were almost designed to have it at like the four or five o'clock way back here. And by doing so, you can see how my arm articulates differently in the, the uh, position of my wrist changes as I go further back, all right? So when, I call, when I'm talking about clock positions, right here is 12 o'clock, right? Where your belly button's 12 o'clock. Uh, where your mom's tattoo is, that's six o'clock and then just go around like a clock, all right? Hopefully you guys figured that out. If you're able to click on the video, you probably understand that. Um, anyway, Safari Land would make their holsters so canted that you really had to like bend your wrist really weird. And you want your wrist straight, ideally, if you can, when you're drawing your firearm, right? You're just gonna be stronger there. If your wrist is canted any sort of direction, it's gonna make your, your arm a little weak, it's gonna make that grip a little weak, and it's just adding tension. So by eliminating that, you should speed up a little bit, right? It's just a better draw. So what I would recommend, especially for the red dot holsters, is to get rid of that. So you don't want that type of cant like this. I'm sorry, like, yeah, like this. You don't want this type of cant, all right? Ideally, if you wear your holster, and I'll go over positioning in a second, 
but ideally you want a nice straight wrist. So I would recommend at the very least having it right at 12 o'clock. So right where it's completely straight up and down. But what we found over time, and not, not me, but competitive shooters and uh, you know guys like uh, Theory Police that, who, who makes the next product I'm gonna talk about, uh, is that actually having a slight cant rearward, rearward, right? Or a negative cant is what they call it, is going to allow you to draw that firearm faster and uh, with, with less kind of tension in your arm and well, as well as your shoulder, all right? So there's a few options you can do. Uh, if you were to buy a brand new holster, uh, the first one is going to be, I'll just stick with Safari Land products. So this is the Safari Land Cantable Universal Belt Loop. And what this does is you can see here, it's got like a little smiley face. Let me hold that up to you so you can see it there. There we go. So that notch at the bottom here allows you to cant the holster. So you have a little bit of adjustment here. You can kind of articulate that a little bit up and down to allow a different cant on the holster. All right. I found that this alone for the red dot holsters isn't enough. And you need to either do this in conjunction with another product or get a whole different mounting system. But this will work very well on just a standard holster that's not for a red dot pistol. All right. The other thing with these, and there's a lot to cover, guys, so I apologize. I'm going to be long-winded here. The other thing with this is that you'll notice the belt loop right here, the spacing. So where you slide it in your belt. This right here is a Ronin Tactics belt. Uh, their, their belts are going to be 1.75 inches. But you'll see there that there's... There we go. Let's see. There we go. You see that? There we go. You can see there that there's no space up and down right here. So that belt's not going to move. Now, why is that important? Well, as you go to draw your firearm, you don't want to go down the reach for the firearm and then have it shift on your belt. All right. You don't want any play in your firearm. So back in the day when they only made the two point two and a quarter inch openings is guys, including myself, would either zip tie stuff there or put like little rubber spacers in there and really cinch it down. Cause I didn't want to reach for my handgun and have the holster itself shift on the belt. Now Safari Land came out with smaller ones so you can, there's a drop down menu, you can pick what it is. So for this Ronin Tactics belt, that's a 1.75, I went with the opening here, which is also 1.75. So now you eliminated that play, making your holster more consistent uh, in, in a faster draw because your holster is right where it is. There's no play and no sloppiness in it. All right, the next product I'd recommend, this is the old one. I can't, I can't really show you the new one because it's on my belts already. I had two belts and, uh, and that's what I'd run. So this is what it looks like, the old version. Let's see if I hold that up. And this is called a negative camp plate. Uh, the guys over at Theory Police, they're a Canadian based company. Um, good dude, I've chatted with him before. He actually sent me one of the original ones. Uh, so shout out to him. But what this does is completely cants the rifle backwards. So if you put this in conjunction with a Safari Land uh, drop down there, the Cantable, what is it? The Cantable Universal Belt Loop, you now can have, it goes back further and then you can fine tune adjust it exactly where you want. And again, I want it so as I come up that it's either, it's either completely at 12 o'clock or slightly aimed backwards because that's gonna allow you a better grip and a better draw, a faster draw. All right, so that's the first thing. So really I would utilize both of these in conjunction. The newer ones have more adjustment on it. The, uh, the negative camp plate by uh, the Theory Police, uh, I believe Black Box makes them. The newer one has more adjustment, guys, so you can, uh, you can play around with that. You don't actually need both, uh, both of the products. All right, another option which I don't really recommend is going to be the Safari Land QLS. So the QLS system is a, uh, was a quick release or quick whatever, QR, yeah, whatever it is, QLS. Uh, basically, it's this right here, guys. So you've got the plate that goes on the drop down on your holster, and then you can slide this in. So they have a little bit of adjustment as well, all right? But I don't recommend utilizing a QLS, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the pack here, so there's a male and female side of it, it hooks into each other. I don't recommend utilizing that if you don't need to, all right? Because what you're essentially doing is adding two failure points to your holster. And the whole idea is to eliminate as many failure points as you can, not, in, not introduce them. Uh, the other thing too is what you'll find is it starts pulling your holster away from your body more, so it's making you a little wider, which, you know, I carry enough tools and shit, uh, you know, I have enough stuff on my belt that I don't necessarily want to be wider. My, my whole idea behind kit is to be as narrow and streamlined and, and slick as possible. So the more width I have, I'm not looking for. Uh, the other thing with it 
is that it could potentially break and that's why i'm talking about the other failure point all right now if you're not switching firearms all the time which i wouldn't recommend you do anyway uh and most of the time law enforcement guys aren't doing that anyway don't be cheap like me and only have one holster where you have to run it because you have to switch this from your duty belt to the other one i've, I've since fixed that so these qls are are going to be going in the near future but so that, that's just one thing i want to add if you don't need a qls don't use it the other attachment that will allow you to have a ton of adjustment in your holster with the cant of your holster is going to be the true north system uh, i know a couple guys <clears throat> on my team run that but i don't have any experience with it personally it looks like a well-built product it looks like just a, a square of aluminum uh they have a nice little uh you know strap leg strap now that goes along with it so that's another option out there i know a lot of guys are running that it securely fastens to your belt so that that's good and uh from my experience of just checking out my buddies i would highly recommend it um, if you have any experience with it, let me know in the comments. Uh, I, I will probably eventually switch over to those. It's just less parts and I'm all for less parts, less failure points. All right. Uh, I'm just going to stick this on here right now. And I want to show you guys two more things and then we'll, we'll get to the conclusion of this. So with the holster, all right, you'll notice here, I have a drop leg and you're like, well, or I'm sorry, not a drop leg, a, uh, a leg strap, right? And you're like, well, why do you have a leg strap? So it's not just for the bulge in the front of your pants, all right? Although your girlfriend does like that. It's not just for that. I swear it's not just for that. It's not for posting pictures of your groin on Instagram. Uh, it kind of is, but it's not. What this allows you to do is it allows the bottom of the holster to not pull away from your, from your leg, or at least not as much. Because again, it's only elastic, right? So it stretches, uh, it doesn't hinder your movement. You know, you can still run and all sorts of things like that but it just helps a little bit. I find it helps a little bit and it can't just be me because a lot of people do it. But the reason for that is it allows the holster to kind of stay tight to your leg. Because sometimes when you go to draw, what happens is your bottom of your holster when you're pulling the pistol out will catch a little bit and bring it over. And now you're fighting having to pull the gun up and also at an angle. So it just kind of helps with that, right? Because not everyone, everyone's shoulder has to come in slightly. So it helps with that, all right? And there's different ways you could do that. These Safari Land straps <clears throat> came from the old drop leg holsters. I'm pretty sure you can just buy these on their website too, though. So when you get your whole setup, if you're buying your old holster or setting up a belt, you can buy these. There's other companies that make different ones. Uh, I believe if you're looking for like a small, narrow one, I think Forge Concepts, uh, he's a good dude. He's reached out to me a couple times. I don't know too much about him, but uh, he's reached out to me a few times. He makes like a one inch one if you want like kind of a, a slimmer one. I personally like the Safari Land one, which is uh, I think a 1.75 inch. It just seems to work well for me. And uh, that's all it does guys. It just keeps the holster pressed up against your leg. All right, so a couple more things I'm gonna talk about is gonna be the, the ride height. All right, so what I mean by the ride height is essentially this is like a drop down, right? This is most Safari Land holsters. <clears throat> unless you bought an aftermarket one, are gonna come with a mid-ride holster. Uh, so the mid-ride sits here, <coughs> excuse me, and a low is gonna sit here, lower, and then a high is gonna sit very high. All right, so I have always found that the medium is kind of the sweet spot for all of these. <coughs> excuse me, I should've brought water down. Uh, the low, if you're sitting in a vehicle all day, that's just not gonna work. You're gonna jack up your your hips, your alignment's gonna be all jacked up, so I wouldn't recommend that. And then if you're running a high, it's gonna be more comfortable, <coughs> excuse me, it's gonna be more comfortable in a vehicle, but it's gonna slow down your draw. Cause what ends up happening is, if you watch my shoulder, that's about the height for a medium. So this is about the height for a, for a low, that, that's pretty good, I like that. But again, you ha I sit in a vehicle all day and you guys are gonna sit in a vehicle all day. So I wouldn't recommend a low. A medium is going to be right around here. And I just know that just from muscle memory of, of drawing a, you know, a million times. And then your high is going to be like up here. The problem with that is all the, all the pressure and all the tension in my shoulder, right? And then once I get the gun out, a Glock 17 is not the smallest firearm. So you can see how as I bring my, my shoulder up, I have to get, I have to clear that the front of that pistol before I can bring it out. So it's like up a little high. <clears throat> it is comfortable for a car, but I would not recommend it. Uh, mid, mid height is going to be the height I would recommend. Uh, and then th again, that's just a drop down menu when you pick these, if you just, if you don't know which one yours is and you didn't, uh, <coughs> you didn't buy a separate one, it's going to be a mid, it's going to be a mid ride holster. All right. And then lastly, let's talk about the orientation on your body, right? So like I said, my belly button's 12 o'clock as a right-handed shooter, 
If you're a left-handed shooter, you can just hit the dislike button and, and get off my uh, get off my channel. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, much love to Jared from Orion Concepts. But with a with a pistol, I want to have it ideally. If if right at my hip bones are three o'clock, I personally like it at the at the very farthest back. I want it at three o'clock at the very farthest back. So the the line going up your leg, like the the seam in your pants, it's usually around three o'clock. That would be as far back as I would put my holster, all right? Ideally, I like to run it slightly forward to that. I would almost say in between two and three o'clock. So basically right here, all right? And the reason I like that, as you can see, as I draw with my, my shoulder, right? I, it's just kind of natural where I bring my hands up, all right? If I start going back a little further, you can see the tension in your shoulders for that, all right? So that's, that's one reason. Uh, You'll see some guys run it really far forward. They're almost at like the, the one and two o'clock. And the problem I have with that is, can you do any positional stuff, right? So number one is like, you're in the car and it's hitting into you. Uh, and then can you do any positional stuff? Can you kneel down? And when you kneel down, is your holster all bunched up like this? And you know, so you're kneeling down, like, can you draw your gun now from that? Because there might be a day where you have to kneel down and then draw your gun. And if your holster's canted like that, you can't. What I mean by that is like your thighs over here, it'll be like this. First, if you're running it at like the two or three o'clock, if here's your thigh going out, it's basically sitting right here. So it still has the same orientation, all right? So I would recommend playing around with where your, your holster is on your belt, get it in a good spot, and then mark it with you know a chalk or whatever, and then make sure your holster's there, all right? Now, lastly, how do you put on your belt? Because how you put on your belt is super important. Whenever I take my belt, I'll carry it in my gun hand, and I will sit the holster, and I'm gonna stand up to show you, I will put the holster right where I want the holster to be. Because everything else will go in line and will be right where it needs to be as long as I have my holster right where I do it. So as a right-handed shooter, I grab it with my right hand. I don't care where the buckle is, I care where the holster is. I put it right at that two, three o'clock, hold it there, right? And obviously if I had the underbelt, it would stick to me. Hold it there and then buckle it in. And then everything else will be, uh, will be where it needs to be because my reference point is gonna be where my holster is on my body. And now my holster is in the same spot it always is. And that's what you're looking for, guys. With all of this stuff, you're looking for where, uh, you're looking for consistency. You're looking for having it set up the same way every time. That's gonna make you a better shooter. It's gonna make you faster because you're consistent. You're keeping everything exactly where it is. Uh, one other thing for holster, I see a lot of guys doing this and my buddy called this uh, something pretty funny. I'll tell you in a second here. So, Safari Land holsters, all Safari Land holsters that have a light on them, so like light bearing holsters, have a little piece of plastic at the bottom of it. Now, I don't know why that's there. I think I know why it's there. I think it's there for debris coming up the bottom, like shoving this in the mud. And I think it's there for a flashlight uh, accidental discharge. So like if your flashlight's on and you go to a holster, you know, you're not Statue of Liberty and going down, all right? But my buddy called it a Safari Land challenge coin and I thought that was hilarious. So credit out to Brian for that. That, that shit was pretty funny. Uh, I take those out. So you can see this one has a hole in it because I took a pair of needle those pliers and popped it right out. Now, the reason I take those out is I don't know how many times I've been on the range uh, and I had brass from shooting or people next to me shooting land in my holster. And for, for me, I always take them out. But for some guys, what you'll find who keep them in is that piece of brass will end right at the bottom. So right on top of this. And then when they go to holster their gun, two things are happening. One, they're smashing the crap out of their flashlight lens. And two, they can't holster their pistol, right? So I don't want any debris getting in here that's going to impede me reholstering my firearm. So I pop those out. Uh, I, I've just found from, you know, from teaching recruit classes where guys have them in, guys have them out. I've just found there's always been more problems having those in. Uh, another reason why they might put them in there, honestly, is to help probably with the with the, the formation of the holster and the rigidity of the holster. If you know exactly why they put them in there, uh, let me know in the comments because I actually am curious. I should probably just reach out as far land to ask. But that's it, guys. Uh, I hope this helped you when picking out where, uh, picking out what holster to use, whether it's level one, level two, level three, and understanding kind of my thought process behind uh, when to utilize level one, level two, level three as well as how to orient it on your body, all right? I hope now you guys understand the, the negative cant and why that's important, or at least important to me. I hope you understand the ride height and how that's gonna affect your draw. And I hope you understand where to orient that around your body, all right? So if you have any questions, send me a DM or drop a message uh, down in the comments and I'll answer you. And until next time, take care.